Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting. Tonight is Tuesday, May 14th. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? All right, seeing none, um, may I have a motion to approve uh, the school board minutes? I move we approve the school board minutes from the regular business meeting Tuesday, April 4th, 2019. Second. Okay. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? Next, we have comments from our student reps. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so, to start off, um, I think this is the first meeting we've um, been to since the new power school thing has been implemented. So we just wanted to bring that up because we know that a lot, or a lot of students have come up to us, like specifically, just voicing their concerns and. Um, so it's clearly like an, something that students have a lot to say about. Um, um, yeah, I think for a lot of students, it's kind of been like a tough transition um, from going to having 24 seven access to their grades to a Monday. And I think there are some advantages to that, but I also at the same time think there are some disadvantages. Um, a lot of students who aren't on, as on top of their work rely on the power school portal in order to check and see if they have missing grades and stuff like that. And I was just in a classroom yesterday and a kid was went in and was like, I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't like get this stuff in because I don't know what I've missed because the power school portal is only open one day a week. So I think that's been kind of a struggle for kids who don't necessarily have as much of an academic drive um, in school and also... I feel like it should have been a little bit more of a school discussion before it being restricted because I think a lot of kids had some other great ideas about stress management and not necessarily going straight to taking the portal away. Um, I'm slightly biased though. I know I'm very addicted to my grids, so like, I can't say much to that, but um, yeah. One other thing was that students have come up to us and said was that um, at any other time of the year they felt like it would have been like or they feel like that it would be helpful it's just that it was the kind of the end of the year and students do need to know like what they need what they're missing or maybe if they do need to make up a grade they feel like they should or should be able to check if they like have not as great of a grade just so that they have the ability to make it up before the year is over yeah those I are just some things yeah it's just tough yeah. like kind of closing out the end of the year and only knowing what your grades are for one, for a certain six hour period. I think that's really hard for kids. And especially for juniors, cause it's like a really important time of year for us um, when applying to colleges and stuff like that and to have access and see what you need to improve, what you don't need to improve. And yes, it's a lot of stress, but it's okay to be a little bit stressed sometimes. Cause like kind of motivates you, at least for me. But, and then in other news in high school, uh, AP exams are going on right now. I don't really know what that is. <laughs> Um, AP exams are going on right now, so a lot of students are studying for that. Um, and I think other than that, just um, seniors are almost done, so yeah, yeah. this is their last big week changes in high, in high school, kind of. <laughs> yeah, big transition. So yeah, yeah that's it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Do students feel like they have an opportunity to talk with administration and voice their concerns and help come up with a better solution? Yeah, I think a, one big thing that students have said is that they wish that they had kind of a voice in the um, change. So I think if that were to be like, if that if we could make that something that would be that could happen, I think a lot of students would um, like that opportunity. Yeah, I think students would like more of a sit down kind of. It wasn't really explained to us very much. It was kind of just in an email. And I think a lot of students would have been more beneficial if it were to be more of an assembly talk. Like, this is what's gonna happen. This is why we're doing it. Just a little bit more formal so students really understand more. Um, Cause I think there's a certain amount of misunderstanding that is probably involved in the new power school. Um, 
Well, I really, really appreciate your sharing your feedback, not only with the school board, but for all the administrators who are listening here tonight. And um, I think this is a perfect example of how important um, and helpful the student rep role can be. I mean, you're doing exactly what you should be. You're listening to your peers, you're coming back and telling us, and um, I, I think your feedback that you shared tonight will probably um, make a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're all set. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's all you have. Thank you. Um, okay. Next, um, are there any um, members of the public who would like to um, comment on agenda items? Seeing none. Okay, next we have um, on our agenda presentations. First, we have the award uh, recipients for the 2019 Maine Regional Scholastics Art, Award, Art Awards. And Rosamund Gross. Hmm. Hi, that's me. Uh -huh. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Rosamond Gross, and I teach visual art at the high school. And I'm here tonight with two out of three high school students who are recognized this year for their artistic accomplishments through the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. And we've been invited to share with you all both the recognized works themselves created by these young artists and to share some insight in their own words into their process and their experiences with the arts here at Cape and on their own. And uh, I just wanted to share a bit about the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. And it's something that was established in 1923 and is presented by the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is a nonprofit organization with the quote unquote mission to identify teenagers with exceptional artistic and literary talent and bring their remarkable work to a national audience through the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. And it's one of the nation's largest, longest running and um, most prestigious visual and literary arts program, recognizing creative accomplishments of students in grades seven through 12. And I myself uh, recall feeling uh, excited and honored during my own high school career uh, when a drawing that I created of a bicycle, I recall, uh, was recognized through the Scholastic Arts and hung on display in public view uh, in downtown Boston. And here in Maine, the, the Maine College of Art is an affiliate partner of the Scholastic Art Awards and organizes the regional submissions. And regional awards include Gold Key, Silver Key, Honorable Mention, American Visions nominee, and American Voices nominee. And Gold Keys and American Vision and Voices nominees advance onto um, national judging. And artwork is submitted under 17 different categories, such as digital art, painting, photography, sculpture, et cetera. And the judging criteria is based on originality, technical skill, and emergence of a personal vision or voice. And I have placed a QR code, oh, is it here? here. Yes. Um, which, if you scan it with a fancy device, will bring you to the Google Photo album, and that shows each of the five recognized uh, works of art for 2019 from the high school. Um, and I would like to uh, introduce both Cecily Trout, who is a sophomore, and she received an honorable mention and a silver key for her two uh, paintings, drawing paintings. And Vivian Sullivan, who's a junior, and received an honorable mention and a silver key for her painting and digital art. And Julia Mackay, who is a junior, uh, was also recognized with a gold key and was an American Visions nominee. She's not here tonight uh, because she's studying for the semester at the Oxbow School in Napa, California, which is a single semester arts school for high school juniors and seniors. And I just encourage um, you all to give feedback to these young artists and celebrate with them in their recognition through the Scholastic Art Awards. Um, and Cecily, I'd like to invite you to come on up and 
Uh, tell us about uh, the pieces that were recognized this year. Hi, I'm Cecily. <laughs> this was the drawing that I got oh a Silver Key Award for, and I saw a photo from a journalist online, and I was inspired by the photo, and I thought she had a really intense look on her face, and I wanted to draw it immediately. So I used Copic sketch markers to draw it. And then this was the honorable mention and award and kind of the same thing. I used Copic sketch markers. First I sketched it out and then I filled it in with the markers. And I can't remember if I used a photo in particular to, to go off of, but for a reference. That's beautiful. What? I just want to see it. Oh, they want to see it there. Want to see. The audience wants to see it. You show them out there. <laughs> Do you want to see the other one? Yes. Which was the other one? Amazing. Uh, and Vivian, would you kindly come on up and share your pieces? I'll give your van away. <laughs> I'm Vivian Sullivan, and um, so I first got involved in the Scholastic Arts and Writing um, Awards um, in 7th grade. I um, <clears throat> learned about it through my middle school art teacher, um, Mrs. Froner, and um, since 7th grade, um, every year I have um, contributed art into the, um, to the Scholastics. Um, so, this past um, year, I submitted this piece, which was inspired by my friend, um, Helen Vaughn. She actually just started um, a beekeeping club, so I um, was super inspired by that, and I had a photo shoot with her, um, and this piece was oil paint on wood. Um, <clears throat> And I also made that piece, which is a digital piece. Um, and one morning I just woke up and I was inspired by the art community on um, many of the social medias um, <coughs> that I'm on. And so I just created that with um, my school iPad. Um, and um, while I did the, both of those pieces at home on my own time, I've also um, created pieces within the classroom, like this one, um, which was from, um, I, I did a kind of, I copied my face on a printer copier um, thing, and I made a charcoal drawing of it um, in the classroom. So I won a gold key for that last year. Yes, uh, so Julia, again, she's away this semester, um, but you can, you can check out her work online. Um, but she did a fabulous uh, painting, I believe, of gummy bears, and I believe it was an oil painting. Um, and she actually created that uh, through uh, a class at Mecca. And so um, 
many of our students are involved with some with other classes outside of school and in addition to the work that they create within the school so they're very busy <laughs> great Thank you so much for coming and, and all the students for sharing their work. It truly shows passion and um, a lifelong interest in the arts and it's amazing to behold. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Jessica and I'm here to talk to you about our ESOL program. the Portland area. I moved here last summer when my husband accepted a job. I studied at Boston University for grad school and for the past 12 years I was teaching English learners in Newton, Massachusetts. A fun fact is that I also consider myself a language learner. I studied Spanish for many years in both high school and college and I was able to study abroad in Mexico and also Spain. And for the first time, I understood what it felt like to be dropped in a place where you didn't fully understand the language and the culture. Here's a little bit about our English language learners this year. We have 19 students. 10 students are at Palm Cove, six are at the middle school, and three are at the high school. We have 11 different languages in our program. The most common ones are Spanish and Arabic. Our English learners and their families are from Canada, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Iceland, India, Iraq, Netherlands, Pakistan, Peru, Rwanda, and Venezuela. Whew, we're truly an international program. Maine is a part of the WIDA consortium. WIDA stands for World Class Instructional Design and Assessment, and they provide us with guidance for teaching ELLs and also with the annual access test. So every year, students are tested on their academic language in the four language domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. The access test also gives us information about our students' proficiency levels. A level one student would be a beginner, and a level six student would be comparable to a native speaker. In order to exit from the ELL program, you would need to achieve a proficiency level of 4.5. And research shows that it takes five to seven years to fully develop academic language. We just received our access scores from this year, and I'm happy to report that all of our students made progress, and many of our students made a lot of progress. We had three students exit the program this year. Some of our goals of the ESOL program, our main goal is to help students achieve English proficiency. Part of my job is also to develop an individual language plan for each student, which outlines goals and monitors progress. I also meet with content teachers and provide strategies and support. And finally, uh, main goal is to celebrate diversity in CAPE and um, to really support the ELL students and also to um, 
enrich our community. Whenever you have students together from different cultures, it really benefits the entire community as a whole. Can I take any questions? I have a question. <coughs> Hi. Those that were in the program that you said exited the program, for how long were they in the program for? Do you know? Um, I know you're new, but. Yeah, so one student was in the program for one year, and oh, so wow. he, he had just moved here. So, um, well, moved to Cape, but he had um, been living in Falmouth before that, so he wasn't new to the United States exactly. Um, another student, I think it was his third year, and um, another student who exited was actually born in the United States, but his family speaks um, another language at home, so he exited as well. I don't. I don't have any questions really. I'm encouraged that it, the number, you know, of students um, has increased. I think that's exciting for all of us, and um, wonderful that uh, there are kids who are graduating from the program as well. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we're going to move on to administrative reports. Principal updates first. Jason went home sick, so oh, okay. that's why he's not here tonight to talk about the elementary school. I'm not going to talk about the elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> so um, every year, it, life in a school, and especially a middle school, kind of ebbs and flows throughout the year. And there's this kind of getting this sense of urgency at this time of year, and, and everybody has a lot of things to kind of accomplish and get done. And, because everything can always wait till tomorrow sometimes and nothing's urgent until it becomes urgent. So you can kind of get that, just feel that little bit of a sense happening. And so today when I was thinking about what I would say tonight, I really started to realize, wow, a lot happens here in, in the end of the year. Um, and really it's all dependent upon a lot of our staff going above and beyond a little bit of just their classroom responsibilities. So some of those things, um, that we do, and I just I have a quick little list that I thought of when I was just kind of sitting there thinking, but so all within the last either week or coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, for example, we just ha we have the grade five classes are going to the Freedom Trail in Boston, so you know, they're packing up 125 kids and, and a bunch of chaperones and they're gonna go take them through Boston. Again, they don't really have to do that, but it's important to them to do it. And it's great, for, and the kids are looking forward to it, they love it, but at this time of year, it's just another thing, and it's a And I'm impressed that they wanna go and tackle that challenge. Um, with NWEAs coming up next week, and there'll be a lot of excuses and reasons why that's hard to manage right now, but they're just, they're excited for it and tackling it head on. So, so that's one good example of the Freedom Trail next, um, this Thursday, actually. And then the sixth grade just got back from Chewankee, that's a commitment about all commitments. <laughs> You know, to go and spend the night in Paris and to be there. And, and I got to go out on um, Wednesday, and Mr. Morning went out on Thursday. And it's just so much fun to see kids outside of their comfort zone and where they typically are. And, you know, they're coming back, and today they're like, oh, we're going to eat lunch with our Chawanki group. But, and all of these cool things that carry over and come back from that. And the little success stories that, you know, we never really hear about unless you actually work in the school because we don't advertise them on the billboard. Um, but it's well worth the trip. And it's, for some kids, almost life-changing with some of the things they conquer when they're gone on that trip. So, so that is always really neat to see that and to see the level of excitement within our staff for that. It's, I think it's really impressive and, and something to be proud of. Tonight, for example, 7th and 8th grade band and chorus has a, uh, an event going on right now. Um, if you don't know Mrs. Ramsey, she's in there every morning at 7, it feels like. It's probably not every morning, but it's most mornings. And kids are committed to being in there. But at this time of year, it would be really easy to wear that down a little bit and say, now we got it. But they're in there just kind of always going. And I think it shows some commitment on her part and the students and the parents. Um, but when I just kind of walked around for a while and thought about all those, those things, it's pretty impressive. Uh, we have the book fair coming up. Trail work is going to start for the 8th grade, so they'll be out cleaning up the trails. Then band, and they're back on it again for Memorial. Day Parade, um, you know, weekend event, again, could be somewhere else, but they're there um, with their kids. Fifth grade, just in the past week or so, went to the GMRI and kind of 
helping lead up and prepping them for their trip to Kettle Cove, which is coming up, and then a bunch of other eighth grade trip things. So as I thought about it, it's like, wow, there's really a lot of commitment and energy going on, and the kids feel that, and I think they feel like it's a great place to be for that. Uh, on an admin note, we meet up about every other Tuesday um, as an admin team, and it was exciting. Last week, we were able to, I kind of offered up the middle school staff to be um, the I won't say guinea pigs, but now that I've said it, it kind of is that. Uh, to really have us go in and start working as an admin team on calibrating our observation practices and what we see when we go in rooms, and really not to evaluate staff, but for our benefit to come out and say, wow, is this what you saw and this is what I saw? And, and we can start to calibrate that. So I'm proud of the staff for, I literally told them the day before, hey, you're going to, the whole admin team is going to be in here. Uh, and to get that excited feedback, and, and some of their comments were, we're really, thank you for being proud of us and trusting us enough to have the whole admin team come. Um, so some of that goodwill, you can just feel it bubbling up, and I think the more that we can get out and do those things, it's, it's really beneficial for us, but it also um, puts a feather in the cap of, of the teachers that work hard and, and really appreciate having us in those rooms. So there's been a lot of that kind of stuff happening, and I just think it's, it's a busy time, but it's a good time. So thanks. Uh, Troy, I'm just I'm so excited to see the yellow tulips up getting yeah, ready. They're coming up. I know. They're we were worried if they were going to yeah. come up, and oh, they are up. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's yeah. exciting. That's, that, that's kind to. of a nice kind of spring ending to, to that whole initiative. Mm -hmm. So a few not necessarily connected things. First of all, um, uh, concerning the Power School portal, got a lot of feedback, a little bit more tonight. Um, I will say that I generally pride myself on being doing a good job communicating and talking to students. I will confess that it wasn't the model of communication. Um, we will be um, actively soliciting input. I will say from the input that I've had, I've had about equal numbers of students and parents that's saying um, it was, it's a great decision, it's a horrible decision, and people who say they don't care. Um, but those are all voices that have some specifics built into them. In terms of just clarifying a couple of specifics, the portal is actually open 24 hours. It's open from Monday morning until Tuesday morning. So it can be accessed any time in that, that realm. The last two weeks of the school year, I'm, we are going to have it open every day uh, because those are high stakes time for kids. Um, I will say one of the things I hear from teachers is they are having more conversations with students than they did in the past about how the students are doing um, and what they're missing. Um, so there's a lot of learning on both sides. I suspect next year from the feedback I'm getting we'll maybe have a middle ground somewhere that we have to define. And I'm very open to that and that sort of stuff. Certainly the goal was to reduce stress. Um, it was prompted in large part by a lot of feedback I got from students about how it drove them crazy that every single time they a teacher entered any grade in their portal, they got a bing on their, and, and they felt an almost compulsion to check it. And it's not anything that we had any control over as a school. Individual students did have control, but even when they said, complained about it, and then we told them they had control, they couldn't bring themselves to turn it off. So it was just sort of constant binging, and it's a fascinating conversation. So we'll continue to talk about it. Um, so that's for everybody. Second, um, graduation for board members who don't know is Sunday, June 9th at 1 o'clock, hopefully Fort Williams. Um, the alternative is the gymnasium, but that's where it is. If you haven't yet gotten formal invitations, you will, but we'd love to have board members who are able to come. So again, Sunday, June 9th, 1 o'clock p.m. Um, I wanted to mention advanced placement testing. Um, Julia and Piper mentioned a little bit, so the guidance department has been giving, coordinating hundreds and hundreds of tests. So we all, last week and this week so far, and the remainder of next week. And one of the particular challenges <coughs> here is that the guidance office is down right now, um, half of its staff. So they only have Brandy Lapointe and Marie Cross who are in the in the office doing the coordination. Um, Eamon Keenan, the other school counselor, is actually typically in charge of AP testing. This is all good news. He's been out for 10 days on paternity leave because he and his wife just had a 
another child that it happened to coincide with exactly the two weeks of the AP exams. <laughs> so reportedly he's coming back on Monday and we'll be glad to have him. Um, uh, oh, senior transition project is beginning a week from yesterday. It's beginning on Monday, so seniors will be dispersing for two weeks to various job placements, internship placements, and think that sort of stuff. Um, so we're sort of winding up the year with seniors, meeting with senior leaders on a regular basis to try to keep everybody and their energies channeled in a positive direction. I've been really happy with the leadership of the senior class this year for the entire year, and really the whole class has been great. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention Wednesday early release. I hope I'm not stealing Kathy Stankard's thunder. And I'll, I'll try not to say very much because I know she'll. So one of the things that's been really nice about the last two or three early releases, including the one tomorrow and the one in early June, is there are opportunities that are being taken now to work with between middle school and high school. Um, and that's been true in English, social, English, math, science, and world language so far. So tomorrow there are two departments. We're continuing conversations that have been going on for the last couple of weeks, couple of early releases. So that's very exciting and sort of, um, I think, uh, accomplishing the highest and best use of what the goal was of having an early release program because those kinds of meetings could not otherwise happen. So thank you very much for that. Does anybody have any questions? I yes. don't have a question. I just wanted to to um, add the student driven learning um, exhibition yesterday. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for reminding me of that. I, I thought that was really impressive and it was so encouraging to see like at least three or four more students this year than last year. Yeah. So, so what Suzanne is mentioning is we have a student driven learning program that's coordinated by John Holdridge. And so yesterday the students were outside the cafeteria presenting. Um, some of the work that they had done, and it was from movie making to music composition to redesigning a part or coming up with a conceptual design for part of the cafeteria. Um, one young man was doing as a, a YouTube channel that he's created. I'm, I'm going to forget some others. There are an exciting oh, oh. variety of things. Yeah, and somebody was a warden, you know. Tra uh worked with a police officer and a warden? Exactly. A, a, young, warden. a senior who's interested in becoming a game warden in the future was able to um, shadow Officer Ben Davis um, from the Cape Elizabeth Police Department and also a game warden on two or three occasions and has really made, been able to do some networking. And one of the, when I talked to the students, I asked them all, you know, because these are all areas of passion for students, and I said, what's the difference actually having the time for student within the school day to do it in terms of student driven learning and getting credit. And they really appreciated the fact that it, it's that 50 minutes a day for three days, it's out of our four day rotation. It really does give them time and a focus um, of energy for, for doing precisely the things that they love. There's some really good work coming out of it. I was very impressed. There was one young man who wrote a 50 page story um, that I suspect none of his teachers would ever have suspected that he would write a 50-page story um, at any point in his high school career. So it was really quite impressive. And to hear them all talk about it so passionately was really gratifying. Thank you for reminding me about that. No, I was just so impressed yesterday. And there's, there was one young man who's uh, um, affiliated with a school board member who was featured as a star in a number of a number of videos as well. So that was kind of interesting to see. So That's not why I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> Future as well. So well, I, I just loved asking everybody, did you have fun? Like everyone's like, this Absolutely. is the best thing I've yep. ever done. Yep. And then there was one one student, this one you referred to, not, not my son, but his friend, who I think combined it not only with SDL but with his English class. So he got two grades for this, one for English and one for student-driven learning. So it's, it was creative, you know, approached it. Two things. So it was great. Anything else? I just wanted to thank you. It sounds like uh, the Power School portal is maybe a work in progress, but, um, but I appreciate you taking a stab at uh, making things better. And, um, you know, it, it sometimes takes time to get it right, but you got to start somewhere. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, 
Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things to share with the board. Um, some of the work that we've been doing in special education, one of the pieces is that the both the Pond Cove special education team as well as the middle school special education team have gotten together in the last couple of uh, the most recent early release days to work on planning for um, students that are transitioning from the fourth grade to the fifth grade. And this collaboration is an effort to make uh, to uh, support, excuse me, <laughs> this, uh, to make <laughs> effort to put support to put supports in place so that students can be successful with the with regard to transition, as well as hopefully diffuse some of the anxiety. As well as there's quite a bit of work going on at the at the middle school and high school as well, in that there are multiple. Uh, transitions that are often just the student and one of the support staff are doing taking trips to the school to help foster relationships and make those connections again to help diffuse some of that the worry and the anxiety of the transition in itself um, at Pond Cove um, the Pond Cove special education team recently we conducted CDS transfer IEP meetings for students who are currently provided services through child development services, but will be coming to kindergarten next year. We currently have seven students slated to join the Pond Cove community this fall. Um, I also, um, at the state level, I just wanted to mention that there has been no significant news with regard to public schools assuming the responsibility for special education services for preschoolers. You beat me to my question. <laughs> There, there, recent, there was another bill submitted just today, um, but again, it's, as far as significant news, nothing on that front. Um, currently, we are servicing 166 students in special education. Pond Cove, we have 70 students. Middle school, we have 46. And at the high school, we have 50. We have approximately 16 students in referral for special education services and two out-of-district placements. And do you have any questions? Not anymore. <laughs> Thank you for focusing on the transition um, between the school buildings. I'm, I'm sure that will make a difference. Thank you. I still have a few things to say. <laughs> Um, I want to start with EL. Um, you, you had that wonderful presentation on, on the services we provide for our English learners, and I wanted to update you on where we stand for next year. Um, we anticipate um, 14 Ls at this point. Um, those are students in grades 1 through 12, so those are known commodities. Um, Jessica mentioned that three have exited the program, and then we have two students who are moving. Um, we are screening six kindergartners, and I recall at a workshop the question came up whether it would make more sense to screen the kindergartners now, and I did ask Jessica about that, and she said that that early screening is not recommended. It can result in the over-identification of ELLs. So much progress is made over the kindergarten, uh, over the summer at, at, at that kindergarten age. Um, and also in kindergarten, unlike the other grades, uh, a kindergartner has to score a 6.0 rather than a 4.5. So we want to, um, it just makes a lot more sense then to do that screening um, in September, even though it, it, it can be difficult in terms of scheduling. It's, it's just considered best practice. And uh, Jessica and I have been working together to revise the LAUP plan. There was a copy of it in your packet, and I'll be, I'm sure I'll be back again in a few minutes to talk about that. Um, so that's OK. That's it for um, EL. In terms of uh, uh, gifted and talented, I wanted to mention, it's, again, you'll see it on the agenda, but um, that our gifted and talented teacher, Christine Winterbrook, has resigned. She is moving to the Seattle area. So we have posted for her position and hope to have someone hired by next month. Um, and she's though remaining on top of the job and is in the process of overseeing the screening and identification process which is, occurs for students in grades third, fifth, and seventh. And then in professional development land, um, you know we have a PD Wednesday tomorrow and I'll, I'll let you know since Jason's not here what's happening at Pond Cove. There's going to be a, a refresher on how to administer the NWEA because they're going to be conducting NWEA testing next week. And the, um, after that's completed, then the teachers are going to be looking at 
um, science. So this is the third PD Wednesday that's been devoted to science. There were significant revisions to the science curriculum this year. So it's looking back and looking forward. So how did things work this year, given all the changes that we made, and what supports do we need to um, continue the, the, the process of, of um, improving our science curriculum? Um, at middle school, um, uh, as Jeff mentioned, the 7th and 12th grade, 7th through 12th grade ELA teachers are going to be working together. Um, their intent is to identify an appropriately challenging reading passage for each grade level and then to develop a set of multiple choice questions for each passage, passage that can be administered next year. So um, they're looking at alignment, vertical alignment, um, and common assessment. So excited about that work. Um, fifth and fifth through twelfth grade world language teachers are going to be doing similar work. Um, the allied arts teachers are going to be working with our great schools partnership coach again. How did the year go, um, and what what do we want to do for next year? Starting to look at, at that planning. And I'm going to be working with the fifth and sixth grade ELA teachers. That's at the middle school. And then at the high school, those teachers who aren't working vertically across schools are going to be looking at student work. And this is work that they started, I think, was it at a faculty meeting? Um, and uh, that's just really, really, really useful work. Um, an assessment will be given. The teacher brings the results of that assessment to the table. And then the teachers look at it collectively. Um, and they're looking at what are the strengths in our instruction. Um, and this is particularly valuable when it's a common assessment. What are the strengths in our instruction? What misconceptions do our students have? What skills do we need, do we need to, to emphasize the next time around? So really, really, really good work. And they'll be doing that by department. Um, and then we are starting the process of uh, soliciting applications for summer work. Um, that process will begin next year. As, as we did last summer, we're seeking collaborative projects that are designed to advance district and building goals. And that's it. Questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Everybody. Um, I just want to talk to you. So every time I come up, you always say, hey, we're looking good. We're in good shape financially. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that when I've been saying that, I've been comparing it to 100% of our budget. But as the end of the year, end of the school year is fast approaching, um, I felt it was prudent to recommend to the superintendent that we have a budget freeze in order to increase the amount we can put into our fund balance um, for future years. So that's why if you saw the email from Donna that we are having a budget freeze for the rest of the year to help put more funds into the fund balance for the year end. So other than that, everything is um, pretty much on track. Any questions for me? Oh, yes. So can you elaborate on what that entails? Because just for everyone's general edification, what budget freeze means. Okay. Well, uh, it's um, a budget freeze is when any purchase that is requested or is undertaken has to go into more scrutiny, primarily by the superintendent and also by myself. But um, So any purchase that anybody wants to make, they can't just go over to Walmart and purchase something. They really got to make sure that um, they get the prior approval ahead of time. Um, or they could very well be denied getting reimbursement, getting reimbursed for it, or will deny even paying for something. So, so that includes items that were budgeted for, or not necessarily. Um, a lot of people have put in purchase orders already, and those are all being um, approved and, and paid for. It's just for any last-minute items, and, and the superintendent has given everybody a week to kind of get in any personal reimbursements and stuff that they needed to have. Um, that they needed reimbursement for. Okay. okay. Well, it sounds like you should have a budget freeze all year round. Uh, <laughs> because if you need an approval, yes, there should be a certain amount of purchase that you don't need approval. But if it's over $100 or $500, you need approval. You need to set that policies at some point. We do have a, we have a definitely a procedure that if they want to buy something that's more than $50, they are supposed to do a purchase order, which is a prior approval process. Okay. Um, we are trying, trying to train everybody to go through that process so then um, we have a tighter rein on all the purchases and everything. So. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Will um, summer work come out of the next fiscal year's budget? Okay. Great. Okay. 
is it have we do we do blood differences often or is that um, no, I have. No, I, I have. Yeah, Donna has. Okay. I, I, I have. It's, a, it's very common. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's very common in other districts. I don't know if yeah. Cape Elizabeth has ever had one. I know since I've been here in almost four years, we have not done a budget freeze. So, but as Donna said, it's quite common in other districts. So, is it common at a particular time of the year? It does get more common towards the end of the okay. year when they start, when things start to tighten up, and you know that you need to carry, make sure you have funds for the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, some good news. Uh, U.S. News ranked Cape Elizabeth High School as the second best high school in Maine, second only to Maine School of Science and Mathematics. Uh, Cape Elizabeth High School is ranked as the best traditional high school in Maine. So, yay. This rep represents a combined effort of really all the teachers, staff, and administrators in our district. It's not just a 9-12 honor. It really does represent the whole district. And it also represents the amount of support that the community gives to the school district. The six weighted factors for the ranking include college readiness, which is 30%, and that's measured by the proportion of 12th graders in a school who took and passed either AP or IB exams. College curriculum breadth is worth 10% of the weight, and that is calculated using students who took and passed multiple AP IB, or IB exams in 2016-17. Math and reading proficiency is worth 20%, and that's based on profic proficiency in state tests. Math and reading performance is worth 20%, and that's a comparison of the district's performance on state assessments uh, with what US News predicted for schools with similar demographic characteristics. So that's a comparison of school with the same, schools with the same demographics. Uh, graduation rates are uh, weighted 10%, and that's based on a formula with the students who entered ninth grade in 2012-13 and graduated four years later. And the last category is underserved student performance, and that's worth 10%. And that's based on how the subgroups of black, Hispanic, and low-income students performed in comparison with non-underserved students in the state. So. Um, they took all of those things into consideration when doing those <clears throat> rankings. Another piece of great news is that one of Cape Elizabeth High School seniors, Rohan Friedman, was named one of two Maine's two presidential scholars, and hopefully we can honor him next month. Uh, we'll invite him to come to the meeting. Uh, this is a very exciting honor, um, and we're, we're so pleased for, for Rohan. Last night, the town council voted to approve the FY20 school budget, so we are over the really the second hurdle. And I just want to thank everyone who worked so hard um, to meet the budget goals as identified by the school board. The budget referendum is on Tuesday, June 11th, just to remind people, and I really urge everyone to get out there and vote. Uh, CEF grants. Um, Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation has awarded seven grants to district staff and one student, and there's a description of those grants, uh, grant awardees in your packet. So just a little information about the projects that were awarded. Um, one is aqu called aqu Aquaculture Maine Food Culture, and that's a project-based experiential learning experience to look at how different sectors of Maine um, are changing and developing. Uh, Boys to Men and Hardy Girls is another award. Uh, that's a series of four one-hour workshops on gender stereotypes and identity, healthy relationships and violence prevention for seventh and eighth graders. Uh, there's another spirit series which was awarded and um, we did have that award for this year as well and there were two great performances. Um, it's an immersive three-week residency program to work on a one-act historical bio that students study, co-write, stage, and perform. Um, they just did one a few weeks ago on Harriet Tubman that was pretty amazing. The Hub uh, is another project. It's a creation of a space for volunteer and extended learning opportunities um, at the high school. Um, 
There's a next-gen learning maker ed uh, at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and that's a space and storage area for the new makerspace program at the middle school. There was a project called Positive Bathroom Makeover. This was a student uh, project, a student application for the grant, and um, it's to enhance bathrooms with motivational and inspirational quotes for kids with anxiety or just anyone that needs a positive boost. And the last grant was a permanent communication system for our Cape Elizabeth High School auditorium. When we did the tours last year, we saw that the backstage had no way to communicate with the lighting area, so that will provide for that. So um, I'd like to thank SEAF for the work they do in supporting Cape Elizabeth schools. It's so important. Um, and the students and staff for submitting such interesting and worthwhile grant requests to SEAF. So I believe that those, um, the awardees were um, notified yesterday, so they do know about that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I was going to talk also about um, did the um, administrators going to the middle school, which uh, Troy already talked about, but we had a great visit and we were uh, able to go into, we divided into teams and went into uh, four class, four classrooms, each team went into four classrooms. Um, and we used the Marshall rubrics and um, scored uh, the teachers and then left and went. And, and as Troy said, it was, it was not to evaluate the teachers, but it was for our benefit, it was for our training to make sure that we were on the same page about what we were looking for and how we were scoring. So um, that was a really interesting experience. We thank the, thank the middle school for opening the doors for us. And um, at the next 18 meeting, we're going to the high school. And then following that, we'll go to Pong Cope to do the same thing. So um, the teachers were very, Great, they were really open and wonderful about having us into their classrooms and we saw some great teaching that was going on. Um, you also have in your packet the enrollment numbers as of May 1st and we're down one student at Pond Cove um, from last month and seven students from last May. So that information is in your packet. That's it. Thanks, Donna. That's good. Question, Donna? Sure. Oh, explanation. Um, you said the ranking the, uh, I think there were six ranks to decide uh, what's the best school. Do you know where, how we did, um, uh, which ranks stood out the most and where we need to work more? Um, I didn't say anything that gave us okay, a rank. So okay. Our ranks were different. I think we just okay. got one ranking and that's okay. all of those, those things went together. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to new business, may I have a motion for uh, for seven eight? I move we approve the Lau plan. Second that. Any discussion? We would love some discussion if anybody <laughs> wants to discuss. <laughs> So it's in your packet. Um, it's uh, the last document right before the start of the policies. And um, I, can, I can provide a brief introduction maybe and then walk you through it or just answer questions. Just a brief introduction for the audience. Okay, brief introduction. So um, the Lao Plan is a federal requirement. Um, it's named after a landmark Supreme Court decision from 1974. It was Lau versus Nichols. It's actually uh, named for a person, so it's a capital L and then an EU. It doesn't, we always think it stands for something, but it's just a person's name. Um, and the point was um, to, uh, uh, what that, that Supreme Court decision did was um, to require that school districts have an equal access plan to protect the English language learners. Um, and the required components of the, of the plan are, are, are delineated by section, the sections that you see in our plan. So we begin with a general policy statement, which is really just making the connection to the federal um, and state mandates. Um, you have to identify in your plan who's, who's responsible for its implementation. Typically the superintendent will designate a Lao Plan coordinator in Cape Elizabeth. The Lao Plan coordinator is the director of teaching and learning. Um, and then there's a section on how English language learners are identified and the most important 
um, screening component is the language use survey that is in all of our um, enrollment packets. And so parents or guardians complete that and then based on the results of that survey, then further screening takes place. Um, and that's typically a series of, of assessments. Um, and then once they are formally identified, then they are placed and programming is developed. And Jessica mentioned in her presentation that each student has a, an ILAP, which is um, you know, an individualized language acquisition plan. Um, and uh, as she mentioned, you know, depending on where the student is in, in their uh, language acquisition, it can take up to seven years um, to be able to um, exit services. Um, Student progress is evaluated because we belong to because Maine belongs to this WIDA consortium. Um, that's how that's the primary way in which student progress is evaluated. It's an annual test. Um, even if parents refuse services for their child, their child must take this assessment. Um, but then their I mean their the EL teacher is always tracking the project uh, the progress uh, the classroom progress of um, of the English language learners. Um, uh, as was mentioned, students are able to exit once they achieve that 4.5, unless they're kindergartners, in which case they have to get that 6.0, which is the equivalent of uh, native speech. Um, and then they are monitored for two years. And if there are issues, um, any issues that may be connected to the, the fact of there being English language learners, then we start the process um, over. I mean, you know, that becomes a consideration. Um, the program is evaluated annually. Um, parents are kept apprised in their native language um, as much as possible. Uh, as I mentioned, they do have the right to refer to refuse ESL services. That's um, not typically done. Um, and then we maintain documentation. Yes. Is this new to Cape, or is this just a renewal of an ish initiative? That's a great question. Um, no, you've had a Lau, Lau plan for some time. It hadn't been updated in a while, okay, so, so we took it upon ourselves to update it. Okay. Yes, thank you. I should have clarified that from the beginning. Actually, if you um, go to the website and you find the Lau plan, um, then you'll see when it was originally adopted and then the years in which it was, was revised. I think the last time it was revised was 2012, but Okay. Don't hold okay. me to that. Thanks. But enough had changed that we felt like it needed a reboot. Mm -hmm. Now you Thank have you. a question? <laughs> most of my questions, so I guess my only remaining question is, um, does this reflect our current practice and will there be an effort to get us from where we are now to what's in the plan? This does reflect our current practice. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. That was Thank helpful. you. Oh, good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further discussion? Comments? All those in favor? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we're moving on to uh, 7B and C. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following policies for first reading. No. Uh, you, don't have, you don't have to approve. No. Right. So I move we oh, consider sorry. to approve. We don't have to approve it, no. right? No. We just discuss. Okay. So we just discuss. So just 7B. Sorry. Hope, do you want to sure. bring this up so, to date? Um, 7B no, okay. is just first reading, no vote required. That's policy ACAA, which is harassment and sexual harassment of students. Uh, we did not make any material changes uh, in the discussion. It looks like. Um, the current policy is pretty much in line with the um, Main School Management Association recommended policy, but we did fix some typos and we included some corrections of references to other policies. So it's just a little cleanup on that one. And then moving on to 7C, may I have a motion please? I move we approve the following policies for second reading as outlined in our packet. Uh, policy FF, naming of school facilities, IHBEA program for English learners, and KHC distribution of non-school materials. I have a second? Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Well, I can um, give some background on the, on the policies and the changes that we're suggesting. So in the naming of school facilities, that's policy FF, 
Um, on this one, we, we started out with a fairly um, broad um, uh, discretion of the board to decide whether or not to name a school facility um, in any manner. And we sort of said, you know, we need to put some, put some parameters around this. And at the last meeting, I suggested different varieties of, of restrictions, not naming it after individuals, having a um, sort of requirements around only deceased individuals. Um, and ultimately, we had a very good discussion about it. I think we spent, um, we gave it very, um, you know, the, the attention it deserved, I think, but ultimately came around to, we don't want to handcuff future boards uh, in certain ways. We don't want to say, we're not going to name the facilities after individuals ever, period, because ultimately, um, there might be an exception. And we don't want to put a future board in a situation where they have to say, oh, we have to revise the policy, and then we're going to do this, because there's a, um, you know, we're using an example of a, a heroic um, community member who did something so valiant that everyone just said we have to honor this person in, in this way. So we give future boards the ability to, to name um, facilities after an individual, um, but we also then, you know, included some, some restrictions around that, a caveat that it has to be some, uh, you know, absolutely universal support. Uh, and also the critical part I think that we changed is that we created a committee so the, the board is, isn't going to come to a public meeting and have a debate about you know, naming the facility. That's obviously not really a um, practical method. So we created the committee. The committee has a broad range of community members, board members, um, administrators, teachers, parents. Um, and then they would um, gather input, come to the board with a recommendation. And if the board um, created the committee, they would then approve and ultimately um, final decision always rests with the board and the town council, depending on where the naming would apply to a building, an exterior building or a classroom or hardware facility. So that's the policy as drafted that we're suggesting we adopt. Uh, it includes a broad committee, um, the ability to name after individuals if there's universal support. Uh, we did also include a um, sort of an opinion that we are encouraging uh, people to honor individuals in other ways. So to the extent, you know, this comes up because it is, there's a lot of ways, we want to honor a lot of teachers. There's many teachers who are, who put in years of service and, and are, are, you know, contributors to our, our district. Um, so we did want to include a mention of that. You know, this, they can be, um, they can be honored with um, establishing a scholarship and endowment fund. So we want to include that as a reference. Um, and that's it. So that's the name of school facilities. Um, Can I just uh, hope add to, just to clarify, um, in terms of final final say, if if uh, if it's a classroom or or a location within the school buildings, and the school board has has the final say. If it's an exterior, if it's a building, a new building the naming of an exterior facility, then it goes to the school board, and the school board approves, and it then moves on to town council for their final approval. Yes. So it's just the differentiation between interior and exterior yes, process. Yes, that is correct. And that it's worth noting that this policy is, is actually incorporated as part of one of the town council's policies, so they'll need to update their policy to reflect mm -hmm. this. But right. like you said, internal classrooms, it's within our purview to make final decision, but anything outside of that, if it's town-facing school buildings or you know exterior namings, it would then go to town council. After us, right. Thank you. Um, so just quickly, having read this for the first time, um, I think that the second line, a request shall be made to the school board for a naming request, could be a little wordsmithed. I'll just throw that out there. Um, my other, uh, I would like to thank everybody for giving this the time and thought that it deserves. And, and I, um, I'm sad that I'm not able to make policy committee meetings during spring sports season, but I thank everybody for the work. Um, my last question is really a procedural question, which is at our last business meeting, I believe Hope asked us to share our thoughts and opinions about how to come up with a policy. 
And so, in my opinion, this is a first read, not a second read, because I've never seen it before. So how can it be a second read? Just a question. That, yeah, that's an interesting point. I don't, procedurally, I can't comment on that. Um, yep. We did receive input, and we did have the input that we discussed it at the meeting, and then we draft, and then this was the draft that came out of that. So I suppose we had we had a policy prior to this, right? So we did. So, so it's not a brand new policy, it's right? Just rewording. But when we so. bring a new policy, we usually give it a first read. We let. The, um, but the public. you're using the word new policy, whereas this is not necessarily new, right. which is I'm, I'm not communicating clearly. When This is a major revision to our original policy. So anytime we've made a major revision, first read doesn't apply to only new policy. It applies to major revision. So I'm, I don't, I'm happy with it. I'm, I just want to bring up a procedural... But it um, is the first read. This is the first. This, fir the this first should read. be, in my opinion, a first read this because this is a read. materially not here in the packet until this meeting. Right. Whether it was, he was in a, it was in a different format. It, it was know, a completely it, different it, policy. You know, a skeletal version of this. Yeah. Right. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Well, then you know, I think I don't. I'm not unhappy with the policy. <laughs> I'm happy with it. I just want to make no, sure that I, I we're careful about fair. procedure. I think it's fair to point out and, and, and table this for the next um, business meeting so it gives everybody ample time to um, further consider the, the revised. Um, so do we need a motion to, to table this one in particular um, then? I have a question though because I see that it could be this procedural, it seems, because it is a major revision. Mm -hmm. But if everybody agrees that that they like this for now, for this one, because you said you didn't have any problem mm -hmm. with the policy, for this one, can we approve it? But it's for reference in future, if we're making big changes, it's a first read at our business meeting. So if someone wants to make a motion um, to table it, I guess that's what we're at. Oh, Otherwise, okay. um, we could. The only reason I bring it up is that in, you know, when we've made, let's say, a, a, we were making a, a fairly substantial update to um, accepting gifts and donations, we'll say. Um, we needed to make sure that the public had ample time, and so the first read was, you know, we were seeing it for the first time, the public was seeing it for the first time. That's that's really all I'm talking about. So I, we have a motion that yeah. we would have to withdraw the motion so that we could make a new motion. Does anybody want to do that? <laughs> I don't necessarily want to do that. I just wanted to make a, just a, a point that we would consider being I careful about I this for the future. Good. I think it's wise to make the motion, so help me with this. But, um, so you just want to withdraw, make a motion? I would like to make a motion to withdraw the approval of all of them or just the one? Just the one. Yeah, from uh, policy FF, naming the school facilities for approval this evening. You have a second? Second that. Any discussion? I apologize for being a stickler. Well, we can work on that other <laughs> sentence because that is wordy. Yeah, the request good. is twice. It, it can't be twice. It's not good. <laughs> I, I, I support tabling it. I mean, I think um, if anyone in the public has thoughts they would like to have added. It's wise. So your motion was to approve all of these, so you withdraw that motion? I withdraw that motion okay, to approve then let's all. St let's start over again with FF then. Okay. okay so, so we've just had two people, make, Heather made a motion, Kimberly second a motion to remove FF um, from the slate of um, voting, and we haven't voted on it yet. But all those in favor of tabling it? FF. So now we need a new motion for 7C. So I move we approve the following policies for second reading. I can't do this with these left. IHBEA, Program for English Learners, and KHC, Distribution of Non-School Materials. Can we have a second to this? Second that. Uh, any discussion? Can fill us in? Or? I can, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> So IHBEA is what was originally our program for limited English proficient students. We're now calling it the English Program for English 
learners policy? It's just English, English learners. learners. It's, just it's just English learners. learners. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. I was wondering because the minutes yeah, yeah. And, the, and the policy did not coincide. Um, so the edits to that, uh, as I described last meeting, are we've updated the language to be in line with what we're using in the contemporary context, which is we're no longer saying limited in English proficiency, rather it's English learners. Um, and also to reflect our current process um, around the oversight um, and who is responsible for the loud plan. Um, so that's what we've done. Thank you. And any questions or comments on that one? Uh, and then finally, um, H KHC distribution of non-school materials. So this is a new policy, um, and we did move, this is in the same format that it came to the board meeting last time for the first reading. Uh, and just to give a summary again, what this does is it gives uh, the district guidelines around what can go home in backpack mail, what goes on bulletin boards, what's distributed by emails, and it's effectively it's restricted to school and school related communications. Um, thereby giving the district uh, some, uh, basically a policy to um, guide decisions and, and field and requests. And my understanding is there's numerous requests that come in for distribution materials to the school. So th that, those two are here for approval this month. Thank you. So, okay. Any other comments, questions? All those in favor? On to item 7D. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the superintendent's nominations of personnel to second year probationary contracts according to 20 AMRSA subsection 13201. The deadline for written notice of renewal, non renewal to probationary teachers is May 14th. Also, CEEA collective bargaining agreement. Article 16, contract notification, as outlined in our agenda tonight. May I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Item 7E, consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations of personnel to third year probation, probationary contracts. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the superintendent's nominations of personnel to third year probationary contracts as defined in our meeting materials in our packet. And a second? Second. Second. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Um, any comments or discussion? So just to clarify, so third, moving on to third year probationary contracts once approved, this is their final year, um, of entering their, their final probationary yeah. year. Okay, so this time next year we'll be approving their contract. Right. Okay. okay. All those in favor? Great. Thank you. Item 7F, consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations of personnel to first continuing contracts. May I have a motion, please? I move uh, that we um, approve the superintendent's nomination of personnel to first continuing contracts as outlined in our board meeting agenda. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? See, 7G, consideration to approve the appointment of uh, Montserrat Terras Salvador, a Spanish teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the appointment of Montserrat Terras Salvador, a Spanish teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. May I have a second? I second. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Item 7H, 
I move we approve the appointment of Alexander Inesco as point four computer science teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. I have a second. Second that. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Okay. Item seven I please. I have a motion. I move we approve the appointment of Christine Marshall as point three theater teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. I have a second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Seven J, may I have a motion please? I move we approve Michael Scarpone as instrumental music teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? This is funny. Seven K. Um, notification and resignation is, um, of Christine. It's not funny. Sorry, it's just <laughs> a funny order. Uh, the resignation of Christine Winterbrook, as um, Kathy told us earlier. Um, it's a funny placement. Is that where it normally? Okay. Yeah, here we go. Um, uh, 7L. I have a motion, please. I move that we consider the 2019-2020 notice of school budget adopted by town council and submitted to budget validation referendum be approved and that following council approval of the school budget, the superintendent be authorized to complete, execute, and deliver that notice to the town clerk for use at the budget validation referendum. I have a second. A second. Any discussion? It's very exciting. Yeah. All those in favor? <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, moving on to eight committee reports. Um, Hope you're pretty good, unless you have anything else to add. Okay. <laughs> Paz, um, I went to my first meeting um, last week, and it was the end of the year meeting, and I made <laughs> the nick of time. Um, this year, they're holding the uh, senior, they're calling it a senior celebration um, at Merrill Auditorium, which I think is a, a great venue. Um, I don't have the date in front of me. It's in June, um, but it's... It's open to anybody who is interested. Um, I, I hope to go, um, and that you don't have to make a reservation. We'll post that, I'm sure, on our school website. Um, and other than that, I think uh, they they close with some feed, asking feedback from everybody in the committee about um, ideas for the future. And I think one of the one of the common themes that arose from just various um, people in the group was. Uh, to focus on marketing um, paths specifically to parents, so that the buy-in from parents is increased, which I thought was a good idea. Tech committee. So we are <clears throat> close to the finish line with, with budget, and so that feels like a comfortable time for tech committee to try to come together and do some work on finding a, um, a good website hosting and um, content delivery company. So um, I would like to be in touch with Noel to get this off the ground and I would like to invite anybody, anybody, teachers, administrators, students, board members, community members that would like to be a part of this. Send me an email, let's get this off the ground. Now, sir, Committee, any news? Um, we will be meeting this Thursday, I believe, at 8 a.m. Um, for our second meeting. So, report after that. Thank you. Kimberly, any news from Steve beyond what we heard tonight? Um, no, not much. I was, went to the meeting on Wednesday night last week. They had, I think, just um, had a long um, grant proposal evening, and there was just a general sense of appreciation for people bringing the grants forward and the great work that's being done in our community. Um, and they referenced uh, some really positive feedback from the author of the book that was read in the middle school that um, just a, a lot of kudos to the to the uh, to see the district for um, being open to, to having such a project. So. Thank you. In this one. Okay, any school board agenda requests? Um, okay then. Moving on to announcement of upcoming meetings. 
policy looks like they're meeting on Tuesday, May 28th at 3 p.m. Join conference room. Uh, we have a school board workshop on Tuesday, May 28th at the high school library. And I believe that the um, topic will be further work on the strategic plan. Is that right? Goals. The goals. Identifying the goals. Identifying goals. Um, so I, I, I'm also thinking that you're going to send out another invitation okay. to anybody who is mm -hmm. on the um, future search mm -hmm. um, who wants to continue working with us. That would be great. Okay, next we have item 11. Uh, I still have to correct you. The, uh, my earlier announcement, my calendar says the dropout committee meeting is actually on Friday the 17th. Not Thursday. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, where is it, Nelson? No, it's uh, usually at the main office in high school. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, item 11, may I have a motion, please? I move we enter into executive session according to 1 MRSA section 4056F for the purpose of discussing a student matter. A second. Second, great. Any discussion? No. Uh, See, so we're we're gonna we're gonna move out into executive session and we will come back to adjourn. Did, no one did you vote? Not yet. Oh I'm just okay. discussing. Um, um, and then we'll come back to adjourn and end the meeting, but no one has to necessarily wait if they don't want to. All those in favor? Sorry, okay. <laughs> didn't want to miss it. So like I'm Thank you for coming back from executive session for item 12. May I have a motion? I move we adjourn. I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, in right now.